In this video, we're going to discuss the reactions of amines with nitrous acid, which is HNO2 or HONO. And this sounds a little bit esoteric, nitrous acid. I mean, it's nitric acid with one less oxygen. But actually, the products we get out of um, these reactions of amines with nitrous acid are interesting and useful. When the amine is primary in particular, we get diazonium salts, which are fantastic electrophiles. And when the amine is secondary, we get nitrosamines or N-nitroso compounds. And these are not super useful on their own, but they actually have very important practical implications because these nitrosamines are notoriously carcinogenic and uh, give rise to DNA alkylators in biochemical systems. So an awareness of nitrosamines is very important. They come from reactions of amines in the environment, in consumer products, with nitrites, which are also found, for example, in a number of food items. And so they're a potentially problematic carcinogen, and we'll learn the chemistry of where they come from, from amines and nitrites or nitrous acid in this video. So let's start with nitrous acid, HNO2. Nitrous acid is a reduced version of nitric acid, you can think of it. It's HNO2 rather than HNO3. So it's a weak acid, and it reacts with amines to form two different products depending on the substitution pattern of the amine, the number of, of uh, carbon groups linked to the amine. For secondary amines, the products are known as nitrosamines or N-nitroso compounds. This NO double bond is known as the nitroso group, so this is an N-nitroso or nitrosamine product. When the amine is primary, the product is known as a diazonium salt, so that we have a diazonium cation. The diazonium group is N2 with a positive charge, and this comes along with a counter anion depending on the acid used to generate the nitrous acid, as we'll see here shortly. Now, typically, nitrous acid is not an acid that you can store for long periods of time. It's susceptible to oxidation to nitric acid and other kinds of reactions. And so, most frequently, we generate nitrous acid, what's called in situ, in the reaction flask, in the reaction mixture, right as soon as it's needed by combining an alkali metal nitrite salt, like lithium nitrite or sodium nitrite, with a strong acid, such as hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And hydrochloric acid is very common and very simple since we're going to get a chloride counter ion for any positively charged intermediates. When nitrous acid is generated in the presence of more acid, for example, more hydrochloric acid, elimination of water can occur to produce the nitrosonium cation and Cl-. And this nitrosonium cation is a fantastic electrophile at nitrogen. We can see that if we push the NO electrons in this triple bond up to oxygen and look at the resonance form in which the nitrogen is positively charged. Arguably the second best resonance form, right, because this nitrogen is violating the octet rule, but this highlights the reactivity of this reactive intermediate. As we've seen many times, the second best resonance form is pointing us to the electrophilic atom in this molecule. So that nitrogen is highly electrophilic, and this gives us a hint as to where the NN bond comes from, for example, in nitrosamines. That nitrosonium cation will coordinate to all manner of Lewis bases and nucleophiles, including amino nitrogens. Now, to understand where this cation comes from, I did want to throw it back to a reaction we've seen previously, electrophilic aromatic nitration, where an analogous cation was generated not from nitrous acid, but from nitric acid with an extra oxygen. Recall that when we mix nitric acid and sulfuric acid in high concentration, sulfuric acid is actually capable of protonating nitric acid, and this creates an H2O plus that can depart as a leaving group, and when it does this, we get a nitronium cation which is actually just the nitrosodium cation up here with an additional oxygen atom. That additional oxygen atom came from the fact that we started with an additional oxygen in the starting nitric acid. So the mechanism of formation of the nitrosonium cation is exactly analogous to the mechanism of the formation of the nitronium cation that we saw previously. 
So this is just a nice um, sort of reasoning by analogy case where we can recognize this reactive intermediate coming under similar circumstances to this reactive intermediate. And their reactivities are similar in both cases. That nitrogen is a fantastic electrophile. What happens when we add an amine into that reaction flask with the nitrosonium cation? Well, what actually transpires depends on whether the amine is primary or secondary. Tertiary amines can't react with the nitrosonium cation in a productive way because they don't have any protons at the nitrogen that can be removed. We're going to look at secondary amines first. These react with the nitrosonium cation to give in nitrosamines after a proton transfer. This is actually pretty straightforward reaction mechanism. The first step is nucleophilic addition of the amine to the nitrogen of the nitrosonium cation. And here I've gone back to the NO triple bond resonance form, although this would work just as well with the um, C, uh, ON double bond resonance form, showing that nitrogen is electrophilic. It's still a fantastic electrophile, of course, in this other resonance form. And that addition gives rise to something that actually looks like a nitrosamine, just with an extra proton on our nucleophile on the nucleophilic nitrogen. And so deprotonation there by something like water, residual water in the reaction mixture, produces a neutral nitrosamine. And here is the structure of the nitrosamine. We have that amino nitrogen connected to the two R groups that were in the original amine. And that nitrogen is connected to the nitroso group. Right here, the NO double bond is the nitroso group. And the byproducts are sodium cation, chloride anion, and a molecule of water derived from the process of generating the nitrosonium cation. All right, let's talk about nitrosamines a little bit. Nitrosamines look like this. They have an alternative resonance form. Notice, this nitrogen has a lone pair. We can push that into a pi bond with the adjacent nitrogen and push the NO double bond electrons onto oxygen showing us that this oxygen is nucleophilic. Potentially, it can be, for example, alkylated or acylated, at least in theory, interesting things can happen as a result of that. This also shows that this nitrogen is potentially electrophilic. For example, a nucleophile could add in here, neutralizing this nitrogen atom. So nitrosamines can do some interesting things. We're not going to get into the details at all, but this alternative resonance form of the nitrosamine is worth keeping in mind. Nitrosamines are most famous for being quite potent cancer-generating agents, carcinogens. They can be generated in foods containing nitrites. I don't know why I always think of hot dogs, but for example, um, cured meats, meats that are cured in solutions containing nitrites, can produce in nitrosamines via reactions of, for example, the amino groups in amino acids in the meat with the nitrous acid generated in the nitrite solutions under acidic conditions. So nitrosamines can be problematic in that they show up in things that we consume and they're known to be potent carcinogens. These can actually give rise to strong alkylating agents, very strong electrophiles that can alkylate DNA, bond to DNA, and essentially disrupt um, the structure of DNA. So that's all we're going to say about in nitrosamines. We're going to spend much more time with the products of reaction of primary amines with nitrous acid, diazonium salts. When primary amines react with nitrous acid, the result is first an N-nitrosamine that is actually unstable, that can react further to eliminate water and ultimately give rise to a diazonium salt, a combination of a diazonium cation and the counter anion of the acid used, which is most commonly chloride. The diazonium group is N2+, and it looks like a fantastic leaving group. To see that, we can imagine the RN bond breaking towards this positively charged nitrogen, and then the leaving group is a gas, N2 gas, and so it can bubble out of the reaction mixture and pretty much be gone forever. So we can imagine, for example, carbocations forming there at R. Let's first uh, dig into the mechanism of formation of the diazonium intermediate. We start by protonating this in nitrosamine and this protonation happens at the oxygen. Recall this resonance structure that we looked at with negative charge on that oxygen. This shows why protonation tends to happen there. This produces this protonated nitrosamine and this can actually engage in a couple of proton transfers, deprotonation here and protonation here. This establishes a water leaving group here, and this is poised to now eliminate water. And notice 
that if we eliminate water by using this lone pair to push it off, the result is an NN triple bond through a beta elimination process, and we've made the diazonium cation. So in essence here, this is an acid-mediated dehydration of this unstable nitrosamine. And the basic reason it's unstable is that the nitrogen does not have two R groups. With this hydrogen here, that hydrogen becomes acidic after this proton transfer to uh, generate the conjugate acid of the nitrosamine. And so ultimately we can eliminate water from this thing and get the diazonium cation. When the R group is alkyl, alkyl diazoniums are very unstable. They rapidly get rid of N2 and then God knows what the resulting carbocations do, right? If we're an aqueous solution, maybe we get an alcohol out of that or something along those lines. But aryl diazoniums are actually remarkably stable. And this is something that you kind of have to see to believe. It's a experiment that's commonly done in organic chemistry teaching laboratories. But aryl diazoniums can be held in water at low temperatures for a very long time. For example, if we start with aniline and we treat with sodium nitrite and HCl to generate that nitrous acid in situ and ultimately get the diazonium cation, that'll sit in water for, for quite a while. Now, it's still a fantastic electrophile. I don't want to uh, downplay the reactivity of the diazonium cation. It's still a fantastic electrophile at this carbon. As soon as we warm up that aqueous solution of this diazonium cation, water will come in and displace N2, and we'll end up with phenol. What we're going to do in the next video is learn how we can use aryl diazoniums in a wide variety of nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions to put different groups at this carbon where the diazonium group is located. Wide variety of nucleophiles. And so this is a great complement to electrophilic aromatic substitution methods. And it's generally quite a bit more mild than the nucleophilic aromatic substitutions involving, for example, benzyne intermediates or extremely electron deficient aromatic rings. These diazonium reactions are so friendly that we're more than happy to run them in teaching laboratories.